our, our next speaker that I had the privilege of introducing is Gary Kalnan. I apologize if I butchered that. Uh, Gary is the co-founder and CEO of Cis Lunar Industries. He is an experienced entrepreneur and finance professional with a long life passion for space. Gary is a graduate of the International Space University Space Studies Program, or ISU, and that is where the idea for Cis Lunar Industries was born. Gary, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with you guys today and uh, for you putting on this, this event. Uh, it's great, it's been great so far. Um, so I, I'm gonna share my screen. I have a short slide presentation that I, I threw together to kind of take you through some of the ideas that we're thinking about right now. Uh, let me just do that right now. See. Yeah, so um, as you heard, I'm Gary Cownan. I'm the, uh, the co-founder and CEO of Sisler Industries. Uh, I come from a business and finance background and come to this topic with really with an entrepreneur's curiosity, as opposed to sort of engineer's expertise or a scientist's perspective. Um, <laughs> more, more like an amateur engineer, if you will. <laughs> uh, but our, our company, Sisler Industries, we, we founded our company to develop and deploy in space metal processing capabilities, which we believe will be critical uh, to the industrial system or economy that we think is just now um, beginning to emerge. And uh, as, as, as I was thinking about the, the introduction this morning and you know, the, the topic of the strategic perspective on all this stuff, um, I, I realized that the way we're looking at this, we're, we're trying to impact the sustainability of the space environment. And uh, sustainable space environment to me is, is one of those strategically critical things to our collective vision for uh, the development and settlement of cislunar space um, and to ensure also the near-term benefits uh, for everyone on earth from all the, the great things that are being deployed in orbit, all the new capabilities that are being launched. Um, if we can't keep the, this space environment clean enough, then, you know, then, then that stuff could go away. Um, so I want to talk about that a little bit. I'll talk about uh, the, the notion that perhaps debris that we see as, as a threat and a challenge for space sustainability could also be used as a resource and in fact a resource to help address the sustainability itself. I'll go into some of our feasibility analysis that we did as we started to investigate this idea and the, you know, some of the major challenges um, that we've encountered or that we have identified, I should say. Um, and then I wanted to introduce a, a concept that, that the in-space salvage and recycling could make the necessary active debris removal that needs to be done significantly more economically viable um, while also laying a foundation for uh, important in-space metal processing capabilities of the future. And, uh, and I'll, I'll, along with that, I'll give you an idea of how we aim to address this opportunity um, by really embracing reusability and in situ resource utilization, thinking of debris as the resource as opposed to sort of natural bodies. But so the next, let's see here. You guys have all seen, I'm sure, this image in one form or another of uh, you know the cloud of debris or objects uh, orbiting the Earth. Um, so so you know, it, it obviously looks very crowded when you represent it this way. Obviously, these, these dots <laughs> in reality are much smaller than they look. Um, and and you know, space is big. And so if you're looking at it on an average basis, uh, some of the pushback on you know, the concern with space debris is that in fact, it's actually not that dense. But, um, but in reality, you know, some orbits are more useful than others, obviously. And, and it's, it's that common usefulness that makes those sort of useful lanes crowded. Um, and, and that's what's driving you know, the, the need to uh, to, to cause those, those to be, become increasingly congested. Obviously, as we see these planned mega constellations coming to fruition, and I think SpaceX is up to, what, a thousand uh, satellites so far, and, and I've seen that they've got plans for anywhere from 12 to, what, 40,000 satellites, uh, and depending on, on the different filings. Um, and then you've got Kuiper and uh, you know, OneWeb and cert certainly many other satellite constellations that, that are less well known. Um, each of these lanes of traffic are becoming increasingly valuable, and it's becoming more and more important to keep those lanes clean. So those, the, the, the orbits themselves become sort of a scarce 
resource in that way. Um, and it increases the, the need and the value of doing debris removal, um, <clears throat> which to this point has been sort of a, a tragedy of the commons more, more or less. But the other thing that, that, I, that it's important to note is that when studies have been done, I think NASA did one uh, as early as 2010, um, and many have followed on this idea that, uh, that, that show that the biggest risks posed by debris are posed by the largest objects. And, and re last year, there, a guy named Darren McKnight of Centauri presented a research which identified the 50 most statistically concerning debris objects in low Earth orbit. Of those objects, 78% of them are rocket bodies. Um, and 80% were launched before 2000, which is a good news story because that means that we're putting less of that up there. But, but the, nevertheless, there's quite a lot of material up there um, that, that uh, you know, is the most dangerous, the most you know, <laughs> um, uncontrolled and sort of potentially catastrophic for the environment. Now, when we looked at this problem, because we were looking at, we want to find a way to do metal processing in orbit and to find uh, a business opportunity in, in that resource uh, utilization. Um, we saw this 9,000 some odd tons of mass already in orbit, um, which is largely composed of refined metal. You know, that looks like an opportunity from a resource utilization perspective. Um, and so we wanted to look into that and see, you know, would that be feasible to address as, as a first resource to go after? Um, and, and that led us to an analysis of, of upper stages initially, which dovetails well with, you know, the risk of upper stages. So from that analysis, what we did is we, obviously we, we looked at upper stages as being useful not just because they're the most dangerous, but but also because you know they, they tend to be um, a higher higher metal content as a percentage than you know most satellites. They have a similar ish shape. You know they're roughly a cylinder uh, and might have some lumps and bumps that are different, but but they're roughly the same shape. They have the same sort of components. You know an engine and and tanks and then usually some kind of metal skin. Uh, and and so we saw big opportunities for obtaining that metal. And even salvaging the structures themselves for for potential reuse, you know, without even having to process them, just cutting them into different shapes or pieces or whatever. There's a lot of opportunity with upper stages. Um, we also limited the size that we were looking at in our analysis for feasibility to a thousand kilograms or more. And it turns out that there's you know a, quite a lot in that range. They range up to nine thousand kilograms for some of the biggest ones, the, the old Russian Zenit stages. Um, and when you break that down, in LEO, you have 1.2 million kilograms of mass that's mostly metal across 821 stages. And in GEO or near GEO, you have around 380,000 kilograms across 159 stages. And we know it's probably actually more than that because we are looking at the, the, um, the space track database, which is you know, obviously a US database. We're not showing our uh, you know, <laughs> sensitive satellites on that list to, to the rest of the world. So, so there are others up there as well that might be classified, but nevertheless, we looked at this and thought, okay, this looks like a lot of material, uh, potentially useful for, for um, you know, as a resource, and <clears throat> could be used for in space manufacturing and construction if if we could capture it and get it to where it needs to be be used. Right, and this brings us to some of the the biggest challenges. So when we um, when we looked at the challenges and sort of thinking through the architecture of this, you know, I, I was trying to put together a slide to capture this. This is just sort of what I thought of when I was putting this together. Obviously, it's not a fully complete list of all the challenges. There are many, um, but starting with orbital mechanics, you know, what what turns out that in geo trying to address this as a material um, is actually relatively easy. Most of the objects are, you know plus or minus 15 degrees of, of zero in an orbital plane. They're, they're all roughly, uh, you know, they're relatively close to that, that orbit. And because you're close to zero, it actually allows for some pretty easy maneuvering just by lowering and raising your, your uh, altitude out there. So getting around in geo is not gonna be much of a problem for this idea. LEO, on the other hand, is a big challenge. You have tons of different orbital planes just because you're in the same, you know, um, Inclination, it doesn't mean that you're in the same orbital plane. So there's there's a lot of challenges that uh, you know as a as an outsider coming in to this idea from from non space background, it wasn't immediately obvious until we really started digging into it. Um, but on the other hand, 
This is also where the biggest problem is for debris right now and where we really need to address it. I mean, there is a problem in GEO as well, but it's not nearly as intense as it is in LEO. Um, so, you know, there's a need, a bigger need, I would say, in LEO, and there's also more going on in LEO right now. So, you know, for the materials, there might also be a bigger need. It's just we have to find a way to solve for the big plane changes that might, might be necessary, unless it just happens to be in the right orbit. Um, and there are, obviously, there will be some materials that, that fall that, that, that way. The next category would be technology. There's a lot of technology to be developed. And, you know, I mean, as Laura indicated in her last talk, that everything takes longer and is harder than you imagine. So, you know, we don't want to underestimate the challenges here. I mean, even the metal processing that we think we have a really good idea for um, is nascent. Um, there's been, you know, metal processing on a space station for research, but not for production. And, uh, and you know, so that's, that's a, a big challenge. We can't just take just take things, metal processing techniques for Earth and take them straight to space because, you know, you have microgravity, you have vacuum, it's a different environment. That can also be used to your advantage, but, you know, that it is a challenge. Uh, logistics technology is in development, you know, the, the space tugs and the um, satellite servicing is in development, but, you know, it still has a ways to go before it's ready for prime time. Um, and in-space manufacturing is also in development. So there's, you know, I think some of these pieces are coming together now. And when we first started looking at this, that wasn't necessarily the case, but now a lot of these pieces actually are starting to come together. Um, and the other thing that's helping with that is NASA and the other agencies have really shifted their focus uh, or their, their thinking from a single use paradigm to a, a reusability paradigm, which is supporting this, this um, you know, on orbit servicing and assembly and manufacturing uh, technologies uh, that would go into this technology vertical here. The other point of, part of it, and that feeds into the same topic, I guess, is the ecosystem. So we don't intend to do all of the pieces to take, go get the debris, process it, use it for something, and sell it to someone. We really just want to develop the the uh, the processing capability, and that means we need other companies to develop all the other pieces. And so we want a vibrant, you know, multiplayer real economy in space. We think that's the only way it's truly sustainable, um, and that's where the biggest opportunities happen. But you know, you still have you need someone who can do the active debris removal. We need propulsion systems. We need a space robotics, communications infrastructure, in space manufacturing. We need platforms to host our our uh, you know processing system on. All those things are are being developed now, and the timing of when those things come to market is totally unknown and you know largely out of our control. So we're working with partners, uh, you know, in all those categories to make sure we understand where they are and if their technology is lining up to match where, where we think we will be at the right time. Um, and then the last piece, which is obviously huge if you're trying to create a business is the market. You know, who is the customer? When are they going to be a customer? How big will the customer be? Um, for the use and sale of just raw materials, like I know that that is gonna be a huge market someday. <laughs> when cislunar space is fully industrialized, that will be massive. It's a massive component of industrial economies on earth. But uh, you know, when that's gonna be, when it's gonna start, who the customer is, is, is a, to a totally big unknown. And it leaves us with the need to, um, to really find a way to find a, a problem we can solve with this idea in the near term. So these challenges and, and looking at these challenges has led us to our, our latest idea uh, and, and the product we think we're gonna bring to market first. Um, and it, it goes back to the, the need for active debris removal. So we know that the biggest problems in, in, in orbit are these large objects and large objects, you know, you can't take them down with the more passive system. I mean, not very effectively with the more passive system. So they're gonna need, probably gonna need some active debris removal systems. And uh, you know that'll build off the satellite servicing uh, robots that are being built now, but there's additional pieces to that puzzle. One of the problems with active debris removal is that it's, it's really too costly right now. And, and most of the, I mean, we, we hear missions announced where they plan on sending you know, one satellite up that has, like there was a, the clear space mission that was recently announced um, from Switzerland that ESA signed up for. It's, I think, 100 million euros to take one satellite up to grab one object and all of it goes down together. Okay, so that's one launch. One thing gets taken out of orbit for $100 million. That, no one's gonna do that except for governments, right? Um, <laughs> and even governments probably aren't gonna do that very often if it's that expensive. So there's an assumption that some, you know, cost benefits are going to accrue as this development occurs, but 
anyway, one, one shot is the problem. Limited uses um, is leading to one of the biggest challenges for active debris removal in our mind. And, and that's basically comes, to, I mean, that comes down largely to, you know, not having been able to carry along with you enough propellant to do more than a handful of missions. I think the largest number I've seen in LEO, you know, where you're bringing it down to an altitude where it can burn up is maybe five, maybe 10, you know, if, if you have a, a large and a very efficient propulsion system. Um, so, you know, that we see that, that, that as, a, as a problem that actually we can solve with, with this idea for using metal and processing metal from space debris. Uh, and so that brings us to, to one of the ways we're looking at to, uh, to try to address this problem right now. So this is what we're calling, uh, well, we're calling the microspace foundry. It's really a compilation of, of systems, but um, the idea is that if you could equip an active debris removal spacecraft, which has limited lifespan right now because of propulsion limitations, with a system that could actually harvest metal from the object that it, that it captures and turn that metal into propellant, which could be used by a propulsion system that uses metal rods for propellant, then you could effectively allow that ADR spacecraft to refuel itself in perpetuity from every mission that it does until some other part wears out. And we know, you know, because satellites spend a lot of time in orbit that you can make most of the parts of the satellite pretty long lived, but you can't make the fuel live any longer than the missions you do with the fuel, and then the fuel's gone. So we want to equip ADR spacecraft um, or any spacecraft really, but in this use case, ADR spacecraft with a system that can reach out and grab and cut metal from the debris. And that's a system that we're not planning to develop ourselves. We have partners that we're working with who are already working on, on me cutting metal in space. Um, so this is actually a technology that's, that's happening. Um, and then on the other end, we have a metal-based propulsion system, which is, you know, which is using metal rods uh, to do like a plasma, uh, <clears throat> a pulse plasma propulsion method. This, you know, there's, there's with a leading company that we're, we're uh, partnering with on this one is Newman Space, but there are others that are working on similar ideas using metal as a propellant. Um, but if you take a company that can do the harvesting and a company that can do the propulsion, then we come into the middle and we develop a system that can receive that metal that's cut off that spacecraft, turn it into a rod and feed that rod into the propulsion system. We want to do this on a size and a scale that's small enough that it can fit, you know, on, on, a, on an ADR spacecraft. Um, so obviously we have to sort of shrink down the idea, but we think if we, you know, if we focus on the one product, that's totally possible. And what it also creates is this modular capability uh, for producing metal rods from metal found in space, um, which can also be used to recycle, you know, on, on, at a, at a uh, like a, a station that's you know building spacecraft for in the excess metals could be recycled and reused. Um, you could take multiple versions of this smaller processing machine and put them together on a platform and achieve a, a higher throughput to make more metal rods. And looking at some of the other purposes that could be used for this, um, we we think of okay, we've got the Leo ADR mission without propellant limitations that I just mentioned, but you can also imagine that the same spacecraft is able to go out and actually completely, this, instead of using just enough of the metal to, to take that spacecraft down and deorbit it and then come back to the next one, you could use it to completely reprocess a, sp a spent upper stage or a satellite, um, which is probably the only way to really remove debris from GEO, unless you're going to send up a spacecraft all the way to GEO to grab something and bring it back down to Earth, um, which is certainly not worth it. Um, you know, this would be one way to remove sensitive objects from geo. It would be also a possibility to, you know, eliminate some of the, the crowding that is inevitably going to occur in geo um, and some of those, those objects that are more sensitively or uh, like moving around in, in more dangerous kind of orbits. Um, so that was one way to completely remove those objects. Production of solid metal propellant for rods can also be used to take the fuel depots. So instead of taking these satellites down to burn them up, if we can process all that metal into fuel rods, we can share it with a company like OrbitFab that's building fuel depots for other kinds of propellant around, uh, around different orbits in LEO, and they can have a solid metal propellant, which has certain advantages in that you don't need a tank, a pressure vessel to contain that material. If you equip other spacecraft with 
um, a, a propulsion system that can use these metal rods. Now we become a supplier of fuel uh, from space debris. And then these metal rods can also be used as feedstock for manufacturing. Um, and, and, uh, and finally, we, could, we envision the use of these metal rods as structural members for in-space construction. And this is just a few of the things. I mean, metal rods is a fundamental object. It's used in manufacturing, can be used for lots of different things. And really the imagination of the end customer is, is the only limit to that. So um, that's kind of where we see the potential applications of this idea. And I guess the, the main thing that, you know, I would sort of loop back around with this is that, um, you know, I think for, in order to address some of these problems, we need to think, especially like active debris removal and trying to find ways to really get ahead of this curve for, um, for the, the lanes crowding and everything, it, it's going to become imperative to find ways to reuse this stuff. If we're launching all this material into space, it seems totally crazy to, to just burn it up and, and waste it. So, you know, recycling and building into, into this whole future in space economy, a circular economy ethos, I think is essential. The further we get out from Earth, the more critical that becomes. So this is not just for ADR, but this is for future use in recycling and reusing literally everything that we can that we take with us, so that we're we're not wasting any of that that um, you know mass and energy that we use to lift things up from Earth. So that's the, the my final thought there, and I'll I'll leave it at that with uh, any questions. Uh your final image is my favorite is one of my favorite pictures that's what i use for a lot of <laughs> i noticed that <laughs> it's like oh that's interesting right. Right. <laughs> um, it's this lunar so, space right <laughs> yeah right exactly that's what we're doing right um so you know first off full uh disclaimer uh gary is not an example uh, Cislunar Industries is not an example of a failed startup. I put <laughs> y'all together, the two of y'all, you know, uh, one then the other, uh, specifically to kind of showcase uh, stuff that was aspirational. Certainly it's aspirational, but it is grounded in, you know, near term technology development, right? That, um, you're not trying to build a space station on orbit. Like maybe someday in some mythical future, if you make rods long enough, maybe that <laughs> becomes part of the trust for somebody else to build a space station. But you're just trying to build the first earliest uh, building blocks, if you will, right? Right. right. So I know you, enough about you that you have shifted and pivoted in order to focus on kind of an attainable target. Can you talk about that, that process a little bit um, and what that has done for your company? Sure, sure. You know, when we first approached this idea, um, as I said, there, there was, there was very, very few of these building blocks were in place, like OrbitFab wasn't in place, there was no refueling concept, you know, the, um, space tugs were limited, mostly conceptual, you know, so, um, but we saw this, we were looking at it from like a, a longer term space resources perspective, and we saw a gap, which was production of metals, so we thought, well, let's make a big space foundry that can, you know, receive metal from, from uh, receive space debris from, from, you know, tugs that are going out and getting it and process it and create metal materials that can then be used by in-space manufacturing. And, you know, Made in Space was making stuff on the space station, uh, plastic at least. Um, and so, you know, we said, well, there's definitely one customer that probably will want this maybe. Um, and, and then, you know, as we delve deeper into it, as sort of new entrepreneurs coming at this, with, sort of from outside of the space sector, except for, you know, ISU experience, kind of getting a light exposure to it, um, we realized that, well, it's not the customer, it's not made in space or whomever that would be the customer of us. It's actually who their customer is that's the customer. And, and really realizing that there's no customer for that end product right now, that all the customers live on earth. And so whatever you do has to ultimately be pointed back at earth somehow, um, made us realize that uh, it was gonna be hard to, to find a use for whatever material we produced. So we might be able to find customers who would pay us just to destroy the material, like a recycling company charges you to drop off your, you know, your old PVs or something. Uh, but 
but it was hard to to really like come up with what the market would be for that. And and you know, obviously, if you're going to raise money from investors, um, which we we are doing, we we need to be able to show them you know some something that looks like a market potential in some reasonable amount of time. And uh, that that led us down to this path where we are now is finding something that's more near term. Um, the other thing that's happened, as as all of you I'm sure I've been watching is. We've been watching, we heard the announcements about Starship and we've been watching the rapid development of that program. And while I had planned in my mind for declining launch costs, and I'm sure they'll decline slower than Elon says they will, but, but nevertheless, I, I'm very confident that at some point here, launch costs will go down dramatically. And one of our bases for our materials case was, oh, if we can process, you know, 1.8 million kilograms of material in LEO, then I can multiply that by the cost of, you know, launching that amount of mass to orbit and it becomes really valuable. But if launching things to orbit only costs $100 per kilo or $1,000 per kilo even, then it's not as valuable anymore. And then you add in the difficulty of getting to those objects and bringing them to one place and it really just became a challenge. So that shifted our perspective to say, could we shrink it all down, address, a challenge that somebody has right now. And we were watching companies like Astroscale raise a ton of money, get a ton of momentum in, in this process, um, and then seeing other companies coming online, getting, getting funds raised, um, and realizing that there might be an opportunity there. If we could help solve their problem, we have, we have a way to start building things, and then that leads to the next thing. Right. So, by the way, we have just a few minutes, so I just want to say, uh, uh, thanks. You know, Lee's got a comment here that I think is accurate. Uh, great example of a great example of the convergence of supply and demand, recognition and targeting, and hypable interests. So nice job on that. Um, <laughs> uh, in a in a friendly way, I'm gonna I'm gonna label her our resident curmudgeon for the afternoon <laughs> um, uh, because she's right. Right. So so. You know, Gary, when you and I met, I don't know, a couple, three years ago or so, I used to refer to your company as unmade in space, right? Mm -hmm. So you have made in space, and they were a guest on our show, on our conference uh, two months ago. And we also had Momentus, which you were just describing space tugs. So we had them on the mm -hmm. show two months ago. And we had uh, Daniel Faber at Orbit Fab on our event two months ago. Mm -hmm. So in a way, this is a continuation of that conversation, right? This is the right. ecosystem developing. It's not there yet. We all acknowledge that. Uh, right. You know, I, uh, I've been saying a lot recently that when we talk about a $25 billion NASA budget, we don't just put pallets of $100 bills together and shoot them into space, we spend that $25 billion down here on the ground. So your talk about developing, you know, uh, the full market is really important. I want to emphasize like in 90 seconds, the circular economy aspect, because I don't think we can get legitimately a lot of people on orbit or onto the moon or eventually out to Mars. If we and we have this kind of one and done throwaway toss it economy. So totally. please, you know, short, short answer. <laughs> I mean, no, that, that's, that's exactly right. I, like, as, as I said earlier, we, we, we need to reuse everything that we bring with us. Um, and ultimately we'll need to manufacture all those components, you know, in situ at the location where we are. Um, so we think this is, you know, developing this technology is recycling technology feeds right into that puzzle. And actually NASA, is interested in that now, and they've they was that was part of their last round of SBRs, one of which we responded to. So, awesome. Well, good awesome. luck with that. Good luck with yeah, that. I'm going to swap it over to Jordan. Thanks a lot, Gary. I really appreciate it. Hey, that. Absolutely, Gary. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time.